Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alyssa, and I'm part of the Skull Foundation team. Inspired by the forum's theme of Closing the Distance, I'm excited to welcome you to this session, Closing the Gap Between Fact and Fake, Solutions to Disinformation. Before we begin, I want to share a few quick items. First off, the session is being recorded and will be released publicly after the event. Please feel free to use the chat to engage with each other and ask questions of the speakers, and there will be a Q&A portion. We're going to be together for 60 minutes, and afterwards, we ask you to please take a few seconds to complete the survey in the poll tab to the right of the Hopin video screen. On social media, we're using the hashtag SkullWF and would love for you to do the same. We are so thrilled to be able to include this session in this year's virtual Skull World Forum and want to extend a special thank you to our moderator speakers and all the schoolmates that helped make it happen. And with that, I'd actually like to introduce our moderator, Ori Okolo, a thought leader on government and civic tech, as well as an impact investor and all around Renaissance woman. Thank you, Ori, for leading us through this conversation and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you to the panelists and to the team that was such an inspiring plenary, and I hope we're able to match up to an exciting um, kickoff. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much for investing your time with us today and joining us on this panel. As Alyssa said, I'm Oriol Kola, and I'll be the moderator. Um, today, we have a fantastic panel on solutions to disinformation, where we will highlight promising solutions to the issue of disinformation globally, share thoughts on what's not working and what's working, and underscore the collective effort that tackling this problem requires for many sectors and actors. Um, before we dive into the panel introductions, I want to encourage you to please connect with each other. I see some of you are already doing that. Share your thoughts in the chat room any resources and ideas that you think will be useful. And obviously we're gonna have time for Q&A um, at the latter half of the, the session. So welcome you to start populating your questions there as well. Our goal today is that whatever your role or interest in this space, by the end of the session, you'll come up with something more, a new idea, a fresh perspective, a new strategy or a push if you are not really doing anything to do more. Um, so the format to give you an idea of what to expect will take a few minutes to introduce each of the panelists i'll kick off the conversation asking questions that draw some high level themes and ideas we should be thinking about and then we'll open up the floor for you to ask specific questions via the chat function that i'll channel accordingly to the panel does that sound good i think it does um and with that i'll get started with the panel introductions uh, first off we have um Kelly Bourne, who is the director of the Cyber Initiative at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Um, Kelly Bourne is the director and she's had um, uh, the foundations, rather, is a 10 year, $130 million grant making effort that aims to build a more robust cybersecurity field and improve policy making. Previously, she was the executive director of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center and prior to that, led the Madison Initiative at the Hewlett Foundation overseeing grant making on campaigns, elections, and digital information, disinformation. Kelly regularly writes and speaks about digital disinformation's negative impact on democracy and elections, and we're thrilled to have her here. I know she's been juggling a lot this week. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, for making the time. Uh, next, we have Julie, who's the Executive Director of Internet Sons Frontiers. Sound for tears, uh, I'm mangling that up. Internet Without Borders, a leading organization uh, that defends digital rights and access to the internet. It sits at the intersection of business and human rights. Her work focuses on creating channels of collaboration between different sets of actors on the internet. We heard earlier from Stacey Abrahams on the importance of breaking down silos and working across different sets of actors, and Julie is definitely doing that. Uh, she's um, a non-resident fellow at the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford University and an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Uh, she's also a member of Facebook's Oversight Board, um, an independent body responsible for making principles, um, 
decisions regarding content moderation and issuing recommendations on policy. And um, we look forward to hearing her views with the multiple hats that she wears. Um, next, we have uh, Mitra. I hope she's been able to join us. Um, she should be joining us soon. Um, and I think Kelly, you might have to mute on your side. Um, Mitra is a um, veteran journalist, media executive, prolific commentator, and author of two books. Uh, she recently launched Epicenter NYC, a newsletter to help New Yorkers get through the pandemic that's currently doing amazing work around vaccine coordination uh, um, and delivery and access in New York. She's also recently co-founded a new media company called URL Media, a network of black and brown owned business, uh, black and brown owned media organizations that share content distribution and revenues to increase their long-term sustainability. She sits on several boards, including Philadelphia Inquirer and writes a weekly column for Fortune. She was most recently the SVP at CNN Digital, and we're hoping she could bring the perspective both of mainstream and new media, as well as um, issues of diversity and inclusion when it comes to disinformation. And last but not least, uh, Adebayo Ikoyo is program manager for Africa with Witness. Adebayo, uh, um, Witness is an international nonprofit organization that helps people use video and technology to protect and defend human rights. And as a human rights lawyer, human rights lawyer with over a decade's experience working across the African continent on various issues, socioeconomic rights, good governance, environmental justice, international criminal accountability, he's more currently focusing on the intersection of human rights and technology. And we're hoping he'd bring us a great perspective, particularly around emerging issues in the global south, um, media literacy, and how to tackle um, these challenges while centering human rights um, issues. And with that, I'll just go dive right in into questions and I'll start off with you, Kelly. Um, you know, given the, the, the perspective that, that, that you, the places that you said, you sort of have a great view, high level, of different um, solutions. You've looked at this um, in your multiple roles. And I'm wondering if you can share uh, from where you sit, what does the landscape of potential solutions look like to this um, issue? Great, thanks, Ori, and, and really glad to be here. So thank you so much. I, uh, I continue to think that these issues are really amongst the most important of, of our time. And I think we can all agree that the interventions that we've seen to date really have not manage to solve the problem. So yeah, I'll go ahead and walk through the sort of landscape of ideas that have been proposed over the last decade or so since I first started doing research in this space. Although I'll start by saying I continue to think the number one most important thing that we can do is to get more algorithmic transparency from these platforms and better access to data to understand the impact that they're having on vulnerable communities around the world because there is still a tremendous amount that we don't know because these platforms have sole ownership of this data. Um, but taking a step back and looking at all of the interventions that have been proposed, uh, they really fall into three main categories. And these were relevant a decade ago and, and really remain relevant. Even of the, the hundreds and thousands of ideas, they tend to fall into one of three main areas. The first is, is really work on the production side. How typically with journalists looking at how do we improve the quality of content that is available online? And I think this is really important work, uh, but also not sufficient to solve this particular problem because we do have great quality content out there on things like climate change or vaccines. And it's just often lost in a sea of noise given the volume of information that we're currently dealing with online. So I think of that production work as really necessary, but, but not sufficient. And then there's a whole second category of work that we've seen over the years downstream uh, focused on audiences, what I think of as the sort of consumption side. How do we get people to be better consumers of information? Fact checking and news literacy were the main uh, areas of work a few years ago. And I think with fact checking, what we've found is that it takes eight minutes to make up a lie, but eight to 15 hours typically to professionally debunk it. Uh, so there are real scale issues there. And then we also see that from years of behavioral science research, that really once people have made up their minds about something like climate change, for example, 
A new fact very seldom changes that. But we have seen in the last few years some interesting innovations in the audience-facing space, uh, things like pre-bunking, inoculation, countermeasures. Uh, so for example, you've seen with ISIS, uh, where people will come in and try and use the, the tools and techniques that social media offers, like micro-targeting, to identify vulnerable populations sooner and then try to provide them with quality content earlier. So I think there are some interesting innovations on the audience side. And then the third category, which a decade ago people really weren't paying much attention to, and certainly since, uh, since the 2016 elections in the U.S. and a range of events that we've seen globally, people are starting to focus more in the middle on the distribution side, looking at the role of social media platforms. And here I think is really the area that offers the most promise because I think the, the scale and the sophistication of the solutions that we're looking at really need to match the scale and speed and sophistication of the problem that's posed by social media. So that's the, the main landscape. Great, thank you. Um, then I'll move over to, to um, Judy, given that the two hats that we uh, that you wear, both at Internet Without Borders um, and on the Oversight Board, in recent events where tech platforms remain at the front and center uh, of this uh, discussion, debate, and solutions around disinformation, uh, what do you feel is working, not working? I'd, I'd like you to touch on maybe um, there's some growing critique that we're over focused on content and that's kind of you know an easy we'll throw more content moderators we'll do this we'll have the oversight board that 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 reviews um your sense of is there room for other uh, measures to be taken for instance transparency around ads transparency around how the algorithm works uh, and a review of you know other measures that platforms can take that are not just about moderation uh, given the whack -a -mole problem that we're seeing there with moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. And uh, uh, I'm very glad to be here. Hello, everyone. Two things on that. Um, the first one, uh, sorry, it will focus a bit on, on content, but I think what we're not doing that well yet is um, having more context making sure that we do have enough context. And that's not a criticism only against platforms, but also against ourselves. We're fighting against fake news, hate speech, and all, and all this very harmful content that we see on, on social media platforms. Why is it important? Because we're really at a critical moment for freedom of expression. How to make sure that our focus on fighting disinformation does not become a fight against our freedom of expression, because that's really a big danger now. And it has become a danger because we are, uh, the urgency, we think the urgency requires us to uh, uh, overlook those very particular details that make a huge difference. And that's something that we've been focusing a lot uh, at not only Internet Sans Frontières, but also at the Oversight Board. At Internet Sans Frontières right now, we're exploring how is it possible to include that context, that very granular knowledge, details uh, that are you know, accessible only to, or that are known mainly by local actors, whether they are journalists, whether they are human rights activists, whether they are uh, women's rights activists, human rights, obviously, uh, whether they are Anyway, the local knowledge, we cannot uh, shy away from looking deeply at it. And even from a machine perspective, how can we include this very hum human production into the machine uh, and particularly automatically uh, moderated system, I mean, automated moderated systems that social media platforms increasingly rely on to respond to those threats. Um, that's the that's the first thing, and not only is it an ex existential, uh, you know, uh, solution not only for freedom of expression, but I think even for these services, for these platforms, we are hearing increasingly that in the world governments shut down access to internet. Well, that was true five years ago. Now they shut down access to Facebook, to Twitter, to WhatsApp, in the name of the fight of freedom of expression. Oh, sorry, in the name of the fight against fake news, but actually fighting against freedom of expression. So that's the 
first aspect. And that and at the oversight board, uh, bringing in that very uh, granular knowledge is at the heart of what we hope to be able to do. First of all, if you look at the how the, the board is composed, it's not only experts uh, from the US or from Western Europe, uh, but I have colleagues in, in India, in Pakistan, in Taiwan, everywhere around the world, experts in, in freedom of expression issues, in journalism, in, in constitutional law, and all, all the various issues that are uh, you know, interesting to the content moderation debate. Not only is it the composition is diverse, but also uh, the, the channels through which we are getting our information to make informed decisions, binding decisions uh, to fa on Facebook and Instagram content moderation. Uh, I will give the example of our public comment procedure that allows individuals, but also organizations to uh, express their opinion um, informed opinion on cases that we're looking at. One example, the former President uh, Trump's suspension has garnered 9,000 public comment, 9,000 plus, uh, um, and we, we have other cases in, in which those public comments were extremely, extremely helpful and help us uh, make our decision. Uh, one last thing that I, I think was important to, to, to mention is that the Disinformation problem is not only about what's being censored but or what being what's being taken down. It's mostly about what's being left up. And on that note, I would I'm really happy to uh, share with you today that as of today, the oversight board is also able not only to take a, a appeals on content that has been taken down, taken down, but also content that is being left up, uh, which are a huge problem. Um, and yes, there was no other place to make this announcement than here. So. Thanks, Ori. Fantastic. Uh, and thanks for sharing uh, that news with us. I think that will be a welcome um, sort of solution. I will, yeah, breaking news during the panel. Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I might ask you in the next round of questions, I will push back a little bit and say beyond content moderation, you, you know, and sort of steps that you're taking, are there things that the oversight board could look at beyond your current mandate? Um, basically, in the, around the algorithm, and you know, we've seen the case of Georgia, uh, a shift when political ads and uh, ran, and they quickly moved mainstream media down, and and things like that in the recent Georgia Senate election. Um, so I might come back to that and see whether there's scope for expansion between content moderation and views on that. Mitra, thanks for joining us. Um, two things. Uh, uh, I know we could go in all sorts of directions. One, I wanted to see whether there was just any response given your extensive career in media and digital mainstream, looking at inclusion and so on. How do we balance uh, and bring context, as Julie said, between sort of um, this battling misinformation, disinformation, preserving rights um, and diversity of voice, or addressing some issues that are particular to certain contexts is one. And then two, you um, recently tweeted, the obsession with mi misinformation allows us to focus on the bad actor uh, instead of fixing ourselves. And I was quite curious about that because there has been um, interesting uh, thoughts around uh, are, are we absolving the user, you know, and, and, and sort of are there nudges there that target the user, whether it's that pop-up thing before you retweet limits on how many sort of fake stories you can forward on WhatsApp right. and, and so on. So welcome your thoughts on those two things. Thanks. Thank you, Uri, and my apologies for my technical difficulties in getting I was thinking there was like a conspiratorial story I could give you, but um, it was truly just tech issues um, to get in. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and also with uh, one of the smartest people who've been thinking about this for quite some time, Julie, who I've known for some time. So I'll, I'll come at it, Ori, from um, the first question, and then we'll get to kind of what I meant by that tweet. Um, they're, they're related. I spent uh, 21 years in mainstream media. My last job was at CNN. It doesn't get more mainstream than CNN globally, right? And um, I have to examine um, 
the combating of misinformation as a construct of journalism. And when you're trying to balance that against what is the good information that's already out there, right? And so there's some cases where a falsehood has been spread and we play a vital role in debunking. And I share this just, you know, I'll sort of get into the nitty gritty with hopes that people extract the broader point. But just as an example, um, a famous example often used is, you know, has the Pope endorsed Donald Trump, right? And so the readership, the way the internet works is that we know there's a discovery process often driven by Google and you'll literally ask the question, did the Pope support Donald Trump? And so at an outlet like CNN, which has more SEO juice than many, many, many other outlets combined, SEO meaning Google results will favor the answer. When I was at CNN, it felt incumbent upon me to actively and quickly debunk not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because you're almost gaming algorithms saying, hey, we have more power than you do. And while the platforms are figuring their strategies on this out to some of Julie's welcome recent news, why don't we play our role as good, you know, citizens and journalists of the internet and leverage our reach in order to be among the first three search results you'll get. And I think that's, a, again, like, it's such an inside baseball tactic that I don't think we talk about enough as far as, look, there are legitimate news organizations that have power and could be leveraging that power in kind of the straight up discovery of content. That's that's one thing is for our news organizations to greater pivot to um, the distribution of misinformation and how do you meet some of the bad actors, as I call them, in these platforms with the right information so that the chances of encountering it is higher. And I think that's something that news organizations need to weave into their workflow of handling breaking news. This sort of gets us, though, to what you're asking about, which was my tweet, which was basically saying, look, like if we keep saying misinformation is the problem, we get to blame other people instead of asking the fundamental question, which is why am I not trusted? Why am I not turned to? And why am I not the solution, the provider of news and information that I think all of us on this panel would agree, you know, information is the ultimate power in our ability to uplift people, right? Whether they're trying to get their kids into school or, um, figure out unemployment, but I mean, we could, we, you know, we, we know that the essence of providing that information equals power. And so I've boiled that down in my current role. I'm, I'm the publisher of Epicenter NYC. We're a community newsletter. Compared to CNN, we are not even just a drop in the bucket. We are like a fraction, like a, a droplet of the big drop in the bucket, right? We are small and in it for our community. And then I also run this broader network called URL Media, which leverages these small outlets and tries to create scale. And, and, and so I'll talk about that as far as how um, we might be able to focus on ourselves as a part of the solution. One I already mentioned in terms of distribution. The second is community. So who are our people and how are we constantly getting the message out that we are for them, by them, as opposed to about them? The reason somebody trusts their uncle on Facebook with misinformation is because he's their uncle. There's a personal relationship that has been established, right? I believe an epicenter is trying to establish personal relationships with our users in a way that front loads relationship, trust, and community. And from there, news and information can be delivered. But that front door, you know, opening the door and establishing relationship before you get to debunking the latest misinformation about vaccines, for example, which is something we've been working on, is absolutely important. The last two areas I'll mention are is format. So I think one challenge, um, both with the platforms as well as with our news outlets, is that we distill things into article, video, fact checks, posts, we actually don't think about how do we, or we don't think enough, I should say. I know smart people, including some of you, are thinking about this. Um, when I tell someone about something Epicenter has discovered, their instinct is to say, you should do an article about that. And I say, no, 
I should let the people who are most affected by this, I should let them know about it first. So what do I mean by that? So we have been helping thousands of New Yorkers get their vaccines. Many undocumented immigrants cannot qualify for their vaccines, despite what the city and state are saying. They show up, they're told, no, you don't have the right documentation. I could do an article saying this person is very frustrated right now, as many articles say. Or I could do what we ended up doing, which was we basically have a public section of our Google Drive that has dozens and dozens of letters that allow you to attest, I am who I am, I work here. You sort of become a part of the solution where you're holding the hand of your user. And the format, I think, is really important because we are trying to kind of debunk some of the bad actors on their terms. We need to find new tools to reach the audiences that actually want to trust and engage with us. The last thing I'll mention is just the power of word of mouth in those communities. Um, the platforms, I think, have kind of made us rush to digital as our only solution, our only tact in combating misinformation. I think the power of one-to-one -one relationships, especially after the pandemic, is something that we are about to want to tap into um, much, much greatly, greater than we have been because it's so clear that the world is not living on Twitter and Facebook. And so how news organizations can uh, really use leverage, you know, kind of that one to many relationship using word of mouth and non-traditional means um, is just another piece of the puzzle we're trying to crack. Um, thank you so much, Mitra. And, and um, just conscious of time. So just for the panelists for the next round and at the bay, I'll come to you just now. Uh, I'll combine the last two questions so that we can just leave enough time for Q and A. And uh, Kelly and Mitra, I think there's some questions for you in the chat. So maybe as as we're going through, if you you know want to take a look and respond there, just in case we don't get enough time at the end to address everybody's um, questions. Um, Adebayo, I'll start actually with not the first question that I said I'd start with, but the second one, because uh, I think the two go well together. You have been vocal on the need for more diverse um, uh, perspectives, how we should be thinking about more inclusive um, solutions when it comes to tackling disinformation. And also some of the things, we always say the global south tends to be the canary in, in, in the gold mine in terms of things that are tested out there first and uh, where even the potential damage is is higher. We've had Myanmar, you know, with Kenyan election. Uh, we're seeing that now with vaccine hesitancy among elderly Africans, just because of what's going on, what's up, it's pretty chaotic. Um, so yeah, your thoughts both on what you're seeing at, at the front lines, but really also what we should be doing as a solution to be more inclusive and bring different perspectives of it as we think about solutions. Last round of questions. It's Kelly, two things, uh, and and I think just Mitra's point, uh, and I, I wish if you could share any examples of the Google Drive and how that works, if any of it is public, Mitra in the chat room, because I really love this idea of one to many sure. and thinking about sure offline right and word of mouth, uh, because there is another universe. Who, as you said, I. Uh, no, no algorithm works. <laughs> the algorithm of who you trust, uh, 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 you know, and, and I think that's a, a interesting way of looking at it. Um, Kelly, back to you. Two things, maybe I, I can ask you to tackle the, both. Uh, there's some excitement around the Biden administration and folks who are being appointed and uh, kind of being seen as the aha. You know, we're going to break up the platforms. We're going to solve all these things with this antitrust and what have you. Uh, or that globalism is back, and that I see there are a lot of questions even in the chat. Is there room for a global approach? So, one, your thoughts on what you think the possibilities are with this administration, and two, um, what are you skeptical? Of? Like, what should we just move on from? Like, really? Like, should we just say, guys, this? not happening, it's not going to get you anywhere, shift your energies to something else. Uh, thanks, Ori. Uh, well, let me start by underscoring what I said at the beginning, which is I firmly believe that the scale and the sophistication of the interventions 
have to match the scale and the sophistication of the problem that we're dealing with. And that these sort of in-person human oriented solutions are not going to meet the, the magnitude of what we're dealing with. We're looking at, you know, 4 billion videos being viewed on Facebook every day and 500 million hours of YouTube videos being uploaded a minute. So I think the solutions need to come from the platforms and as policymakers and the Biden administration and elsewhere begin to look at this. And I think to your global point, there are real opportunities for a transatlantic alliance now to build the sort of backbone of a global democratic alliance to think about how we govern these tech platforms and that there are some global solutions possible. But uh, I think the solutions need to lie predominantly with the platforms and uh, with the at, a, at an internet level of scale. And I spent the last year at Stanford looking at what are all of the proposals around the world that we are hearing to address disinformation online and found that they actually all fell really into one of nine categories. Half of them, I think, actually hold a lot of promise. The other half I'm hugely skeptical of. Um, and then there are a bunch of little detailed ones I won't go into. But the four that I think are most promising, and Julie touched on this a bit, the, the how do we manage uh, the content, right? And that's where most people have been focused. And it gets a little bit whack-a-mole, but there are ways around that. So this is, you know, how do we change the algorithms or the rules that the platforms uh, have in place to get them to delete content, to demote it, to provide more context of disclosing who is behind an advertisement or not allowing political ads at all. And there are two pathways there, right? Self-regulation, which I'm skeptical of given the business model or liability law to come in and reform different laws that have provided immunity and say they are going to be liable for particular types of harmful content. And some people, I think, rightly argue that there are real human rights or real free speech concerns here. But there has got to be a gray area and a way to thread this needle where some liability is possible. Um, so that's the first one. Second, privacy. And of course, privacy is important for so many reasons in the human rights domain. But when it comes to disinformation, the argument is that if bad actors had less detailed data about us, they would not be able to target that as effectively. And you would essentially render disinformation a weapon without a target. And it would just get lost in a sea of noise. So I think privacy could be quite relevant here. Then third, and I mentioned this earlier, I think there are opportunities in the digital literacy space if they are deployed through the platforms, that there is some kind of mandate in the, in the realm of PSA announcements that would require platforms to provide some media literacy training themselves. Uh, and then lastly, as I said, data access, that, that the platforms know what's going on and won't share that data with us is, is, is not sustainable. Um, then... The ones that I'm skeptical of and that I sort of wish would die down, uh, three that I'd highlight here, uh, most of the user-focused solutions. We are too busy. Half of them in the U.S., half of people don't vote most of the time. So the idea that uh, I think the platform sort of threw up their hands and said, we don't want to deal with this, so we're going to give users a bunch of tools, URL filters and political ad blockers and uh, parental controls and you know, experiments with who can respond, blocking respondents on Twitter. There have been ideas that uh, we should create alternative filters so you could opt into a Disney filter or a New York Times filter to match your interests. And I think unless these are mandated, people are just too busy and they're not going to adopt them. Uh, second, there's been a lot of talk about substitute business structures. So could we have a PBS or a BBC for social media? And I think the challenge here is that people don't always want to eat their broccoli. The odds that people are going to want this sort of really tame, high quality, in-depth content, uh, it's not clear, again, that people would adopt it. And then antitrust. Uh, the idea that we can break up. The, I think there are many ways that antitrust can be beneficial. But when it comes to disinformation, uh, we have a whole concern around network effects. You could break up the platforms into little ones. And then because we all want to be connected to our friends, you would just have a baby Facebook grow up to be large again. And you just end up with a, a, a real fragmented problem that's even harder to measure and monitor and understand. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. But I think of those, the data access and transparency, 
some kind of liability reform, privacy protections, and mandated online digital literacy are, are where I would look. Thank you, and for being so succinct uh, as well, given the, the range of potential solutions. Uh, Julia, I'll come to you next, and then at the very end, I see some witness folks also in the group. There have been some questions around censorship um balancing that um or, or in freedom of expression versus censorship maybe if you want to respond to that uh at the bayer and the martin also had a question around um human intervention versus machine learning um so the if, if you can take a look at that and respond as i, I get to julie um to so julie your anything from where you're sitting in terms of what could be done differently what should we move on from um i'll put you on the spot and say you know i'm sure you've debated how much data platforms can share and how they share it i think the hose was open and then closed and then cambridge analytica came and they're like but this was the data that we had shared uh and, and so so where have you landed just in terms of giving but where do you think the direction of travel should be, both from a platform perspective and maybe some of the solutions that um, Kelly has shared and your own views as well, if you have them? Thank you. Thank you, Ori. Um, so several, several things in there are probably two main. The first one, if we're talking about solutions, uh, I think we should all agree that those solutions have to be global. We're talking about spaces, um, for instance, Facebook. Uh, we tend to focus many of the discussions on the US and on the EU, Western Europe, as it has been said, when actually 70%, if my data or you know, my memory is, is correct, 70% of those users are not located in the US and the EU where there are institutions, democratic institutions, where there is stability, uh, where there are safeguards to protect. I mean, you have several layers of safeguards to protect citizens and institutions, democracy against the negative effect of um, disinformation on social media platforms. So once you have that in mind, uh, what, can we talk about, you know, not mandating platforms to take down content because that's a very bad idea that can be copied and that is being copied uh, by our countries that do not have the same democratic safeguards. Um, so yes, I would be interested in that conversation in a more global setting, uh, which has at its heart, at its heart, sorry, preoccupations related to human rights and particularly freedom of expression. And who better than civil society actors to tell you how actually it is possible, or you can try, to protect freedom of expression while getting rid of what is, yeah, what is not factually correct. Um, at the same time, how can we make sure that we're not, again, you, well, we're not transforming this fight against disinformation into shaping a world um, where, you know, where actually, yeah, freedom of expression is becoming the, disin the disinformation uh, is being weaponized as uh, disinformation, um, I, and I'm and I'm thinking I have several examples in mind. Um, uh, well, yeah, I won't give them here because there are too many. But just, just yeah, I'm insisting on that because I really think this is this is this is we are really at a crossroads right here. The second the second aspect that I wanted to to share with you, uh, which is yeah directly related to that, is about the role of governments. Um, Yes, I'm interested. I'm not interested in a confiscation of this conversation around content moderation, disinformation, uh, confiscation of the debate between platforms and governments, because we are 100% headed to censorship. Platform will have to do it because they don't want to lose money uh, because they because of the fines that they might be imposed based on regulation. And while government might have interest to it, uh, even the most democratic one. We should not fool ourselves. Even the, in France recently, a law was censored, like we say in France, censored by the Constitutional Council, uh, a law that was supposed to fight against hate speech and, and fake news on social media platforms. It was censored because it did not have guarantees 
for freedom of expression. So I'm using this example because we are also at a, a tipping point in our history where we have, we have a crisis, a pandemic that has made a lot of things possible, including uh, a closing of our freedoms, especially in particularly in, in places of the world where we had never thought this would have been possible. So um, I think my point is, uh, yes, cautionary tale of not focusing only on, well, having a global, global conversation on that, because what we're going to decide is going to affect freedom of expression and access to internet in general. There's one little thing that I wanted to, to rapidly go back to uh, that you asked me previously, Ori, regarding the conversation around algorithms and machines um, and the board in that there was a piece recently published uh, by, by, by Vox Recode, um, which question whether or not the, the board could have a role to play on that. So what I, what I w would like to say on this is that the board is really a, a, a place, an, a space that is agile and that is completely embedded in its time. We are of course not immune to these debates. One of our first decisions was related to a content that had been automatically taken down based on, well, for adult nudity, nudity, sorry, it was a, a, a bare breast of a woman in, in, in a campaign against breast cancer in Brazil. So we questioned there the transparency. Uh, how, how come your, your algorithms come to that stupid decision? I'm saying stupid purposely because even Facebook recognized that it was an error. So uh, this is to say that we are in uncharted territory here, uh, but at the same time that the board is absolutely in its time, uh, reads the same reports, we all read the same reports, and we do have, um, um, yes, discussions on at least the con content moderate, the algorithmic content moderation and how problematic it can be from the, the perspective of human rights and freedom of expression particularly. So um, what needs to happen for a global conversation to, to occur? Um, I think bringing everybody to the table is very key and very important. The global perspective that, that has been um, reiterated by Julie is essential. Um, and also, I think one thing that we need to pay attention to, because at Witness, we are also concerned about as we try and combat deep, deep fakes, shallow fakes, misinformation, dis disinformation, we are going to start to see a, a, a push for detection tools. And Witness is very concerned that once we start to see detection, detection tools start to come out, that there is also a consideration given to who has access to those detection tools and ensuring that it's again not something that is centered um, in the global north, but that um, is proliferated across the globe um, and given to people who are at the front lines of combating mis and disinformation. Um, we are very concerned that as we encourage people to document videos of human rights abuses and expose atrocities, there are those who are not using the, the problem or, or of deep fakes um, and introducing the last dividend whereby they would just call everything it's a deep fake and that then raises places the burden on the activists on those who are the citizen journalists to ensure that their content and what they're pushing out is authentic whereas it should be the other way around so having a conversation and that's something that we're working with um, alongside partnership on ai and um, trying to ensure that there's equitable access to the detection tools and also talking about you know, a, a human rights approach to platforms and um, technologists who are creating um, some form of advancement, technologically speaking, they should always bear in mind that there could be a human rights repercussion to some of the innovations that they come up with. Um, and I would give this in, this in the example of even the applications that we currently are seeing um, that have been available on mobile devices that are meant to sort of be typically harmless, but allow people to engage in creation of things that tend to be along the lines of deep fakes and shallow fakes. Um, and so we should actually have a conversation with uh, platforms and technological um, innovators themselves and say, you know what, as you're beginning to create these tools, um, you need to also consider that they could be used for nefarious purposes and maybe you should dial back or some form of accountability has to be introduced into the mix. Um, so basically, ensuring it's a global approach, a global conversation. Um, and like I said before, that is something that we are trying to advance critically 
at witness with our convenings um, from Brazil to Pretoria and, and elsewhere, and also engaging in conversations with um, tech companies and tech platforms to ensure that there is accountability uh, across board. Well, the question you're... for me was, Mitra, if you could wave a magic catalytic thing done, what would it be? I might ask for three, but I promise I'll rattle them off very quickly. One is uh, just the data piece that we've talked about on this panel in terms of we know there are bad actors at the root of the misinformation and the opaque ways that um, investigations and uh, and their origins are currently carried out just feels uh, it, like impeding any progress on this issue. Um, the second is kind of a, a marriage of what we've been talking about a sort of like the grassroots human to human approach that I take that's small versus institutional, you know, scale meeting the scale of the problem uh, tension, if you will. And I think it's a both and issue because in some cases, misinformation can't be replaced by uh, mistrust of same said large institutions, right? And it leads to some of the Eurocentric and US centric and in the US certainly white led institutional uh, mistrust that I think ends up excluding some of um, the voices, for example, that uh, are spreading in the word to mouth way. So I, I sort of not seeing that as a, a false choice. And then the last relates to that. And, and I think maybe this is where Adebayo was going, but what are the good ideas that we are allowing to scale, right? There are some, there are some good actors and we keep them small by being you know, this nonprofit over here in the corner, and I'm a for-profit, um, I have two for-profit companies. The number of times that people call us a mutual aid group or a nonprofit just because we're a business trying to do good for our audience is a pretty long number of times, which is really speaking to the mistrust of another institution, which is, you know, business itself and its role in this. Um, so I think what solutions are we allowing to scale? How are we making it businesses to not support solutions driven um, journalism or um, kind of media literacy and um, accurate information um, all feels a good piece of this. And then I'll just mention one other thing in New York City, you know, 50% of government advertising now has to go to community outlets, which has been a bit of a revolution in terms of now this might get us into the who's in bed with who. But from a support of these are the media outlets that we've that we that we can get behind. It's accurate information that's community driven and for users. Um, I think that's another step, just as far as financially supporting them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A question here on whether you know following the money might be part of the solution, and I think potentially yes. But one of the challenges is that often the way these disinformation campaigns work, that it's a very small amount of money upfront that can be used to basically sell political ads. And those ads are used as a tool to recruit people. And then the whole thing becomes organic after that. So oftentimes it's really not very much money. It can be money from a, a wide variety of distributed sources that looks very much like organic free speech that is used to sort of seed a movement. And then that movement starts to propel itself organically. And so the the following the money, I, I used to do a lot of work on money and politics in the United States. And so sort of brought that lens originally to this problem. Uh, but I think the challenge here is that these are free platforms. Very little of the work that we're seeing is paid. Yes, um, I, I agree with, um, uh, with Kelly, um, uh, also not not forgetting that well, when we talk about money, who's profiting, we also have to question well the the place of of some of these big platforms, and particularly through the money that they they receive through political ads. Um, but one thing that I that I wanted to to respond to a question that and. A re very accurate remark. Uh, sorry, I forgot who asked it regarding the well getting away from big tech platforms and um, using more decentralized versions. Uh, that's absolutely somewhere we should go, but not forgetting that, first of all, the next billion to be connected have to be discussed here. Um, these 
people are located in places of the world where it's not the government investing to making sure that they are connected. It's the platforms, Facebook, Google, they all have billions projects, infrastructure, digital infrastructure projects targeting those places of the world. Um, and obviously when they do that, well, they will make sure that these people have access to their services and to their products. So uh, that's a reality that we have uh, to also take into account, especially when we talk about uh, fighting disinformation. Um, that, that's one aspect. The other aspect is absolutely yes to media literacy, absolutely yes to, you know, talking more, educating more about what's at stake, not even, not only on disinformation, but on digital rights in general. Um, I will give an example. We have, uh, we have and have had a project called Nobad Mob in, in Cameroon, which we tried in Cameroon first and then expanded to several countries in Western Central Africa, which uh, aimed at identi pre proactively uh, identifying hate speech and disinformation in Western Central African countries of Francophone expression. It's important to mention this because a lot of efforts are being focused on Russia, US, Europe. So it's important to mention those countries too. Um, and what we found is that when you work with um, uh, local experts, like we call them journalists, civil society organizations who are familiar with issues around free press, free expression, but are not necessarily, uh, I mean, the, the, the notion of disinformation is a concept that's you know, not easy to understand. 10 years ago, when I was working on Gabon for another great platform called Global Voices, we saw on Twitter automated content from Turkey, from India, related to Gabon, but from people who were not Gabonese and who had no idea what Gabon was. But the aim was to flood hashtags created by civil society organizations to call attention uh, to what was happening in the country, flood this asset with positive reviews and positive, uh, you know, assessment of the situation in Gabon and the work of the government. But we didn't know at the time that these were bots, trolls. We just knew it was not normal. So what I'm trying to say here is that we're talking about this global conversation. They should not only happen between governments. They must happen also within academics and civil society organization spaces from the north, where the scientific knowledge is being produced, with the south, where the experience of what is going to be wrong here in three, four, five years, these two need to meet each other and find a space not only to exchange knowledge, but to collaborate on solutions. I think that's that's also part of the one of these solutions. And when you do that, when you equip... Sorry, Julie, I, I want to... Have, Oh, sorry, I talked too much. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm back. Oh, global collaboration. Uh, just with two minutes to close, and I managed to defeat Big Brother, who was trying to censor me. Uh, at the bio, I think everyone and Julie, I think we get your magic wand. Is this global conversation that that brings a different perspectives together, not just government to platforms? At the bio, last word, uh, magic wand. You have 60 seconds to wave your wand and then i'll close off with a vote of thanks sure, <laughs> thank um, you julie sorry it's okay i'm glad you're back ori and if i had a magic wand to wave it would be to have everybody have a lot of media literacy around com combating um misinformation disinformation because at the end of the day just like we've said the scale of the problem is so huge that Algorithms alone can't fix it, and um, throwing more personnel at Facebook and Twitter and the others can't also fix it. We have to really invest in media literacy um, across board, and that's something we are also invested in trying to do um, um, in West Africa at the moment and bring leaders and community activists together to get them um, clued up about not just identifying misinformation, disinformation, but also knowing the tools to authentication and verification as well. I did that within. <laughs> oh, very well done. Thank you, everybody. This call team, I think there's lots of great resources. If there's a way that you're gathering this in your report and add them in, that would be amazing. I'll paraphrase um, Kelly's last word. There is no silver bullet. We need to come at this at scale. Great engaged community here. So I hope you take back what you've learned from this. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think we covered quite a bit in
and, and I hope everyone got something out of it. And thank you to my amazing panelists um, and to the team who worked on putting this together. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I think this is a goodbye. And don't worry, this is great. Bye, everyone. <laughs>